Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. So, um, thank you, Dr. Yasser Raska, for uh, making this happen, and Dr. Muhammad Arafat as well for helping in the preparation of this uh, talk. So, I'll talk about the novel coronavirus, uh, also known as uh, COVID 19. Um, I'll start with the nomenclature. Uh, nomenclature. So, coronavirus is, is a family of RNA viruses that has characteristic crown like uh, virions or viral particles on their surface. Um, that family has more than about seven seven viruses. One of them is the new novel, the novel virus that we are um, experiencing uh, in the world, which is the Corona, uh, what called the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus two or SARS-CoV two, which cause the disease, which is COVID nineteen. COVID nineteen is um, it means the coronavirus disease in two thousand nineteen. So that's the name of the disease and the virus itself named as SARS-CoV-2. So this is a list of different coronaviruses. Most of them uh, cause uh, uh, common cold, uh, but the last three uh, listed here, the SARS, which we experienced uh, in 2001, MERS, which uh, Saudi Arabia have experienced between 2014 until now, and the SARS-CoV-2, which is the novel one in 2001. The main issue with um, uh, with the, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 or the COVID-19 uh, is uh, acute uh, lung injury or acute hypoxemic failure, which mainly caused by alveolar, diffuse alveolar damage, uh, which lead to ARDS. There are some reports currently that some patient does experience uh, a bit of um, improvement and then they get sick again uh, with a, cyto a cytokine storm. This, this uh, does resemble uh, uh, secondary HLH, and there are some reviews and some case reports about that. This is where we stand right now. Uh, as of this morning, there are, there are uh, uh, 182,000 uh, cases around the globe. Um, China had uh, so far 81,000 cases, and the rest of them is in the world. So we surpassed the number that um, uh, the number of patients in, in China as, as a whole world. So now it's as a pandemic as the WHO uh, uh, announced recently. Uh, our numbers in Saudi Arabia so far, we have 133 cases, uh, six recoveries and uh, no deaths so far. Um, we, uh, if you look at the curve right here, you can see that uh, there was some uh, the uh, main mainland chi China. There is a they hit the plateau uh, around here, uh, but the new cases and different key in, in the rest of the world have actually is is spiking. Um, this is a summary from uh, Italy from Lombardy area, uh, which shows the uh, case fatality. Um, as you can see, most of the mortality happens in patients above the age of 60, uh, 50 to 59 is 1%. And really the, the majority of, of uh, mortality happens in the, uh, in the case, in the patient between 80 and 89. Um, also the percentage of critical uh, conditions is 5.0%. Um, currently the mortality rate uh, in, the, in the world is, varies a lot uh, based on um, uh, the country and based on the preparedness of the country. So once the um, healthcare system get overwhelmed, the mortality goes up. So now there are some reports of mortality goes up to 7% in some, some places in the world. Um, so what we do when we have a patient that comes into the ED um, and how can we make sure that we identify those patients fast enough to make sure that we, we get them isolated and get them tested. So one of the uh, ways that we do, uh, do it is using a screening tool. So when the patient first arrives to the ED, they will go to the visual triage uh, in the emergency department before the actual triage. And this is the first safety point. They will apply the risk scoring system. So the risk scoring system was developed for the MERS code and now was updated to include also the um, COVID-19 uh, disease. And as you can see, this is, this is the summary of, um, of the uh, main things that we have to ask. 
The only exception, the updates that now you have to consider any uh, travel from abode as five points. So if you have more than six points, the patient should be placed in isolation and inform MD uh, for assessment and COVID-19 testing should be done. Uh, but also we have to continue thinking about mers because we still have cases of mers every now and then. So we have to screen for that as well. The most important thing, one of the important things that I have to mention that this score does not, um, it does not equate to case definition. So the risk score is just a, um, a, uh, uh, an initial screening tool. After, if the patient scores on that, we will go and apply the case definition to see if this patient is a sus suspected COVID disease, COVID-19 case or not. So the case definition for COVID-19 uh, cases uh, has to include the patient with acute respiratory infection. So fever or recent history of fever, cough, sore throat, uh, shortness of breath, and um, a recent travel abroad or travel within Saudi Arabia to a uh, high risk area, which at this point is the uh, Qatif region, or um, a close contact with uh, in the past 14 days prior to the symptom onset with a patient with confirmed COVID 19 disease, or working in or attended a healthcare facility where a COVID 19 case were admitted. Uh, the second uh, definition um, uh, also uh, is, and this is most important, it's more important for patient, for uh, uh, the inpatient services is, if you have an adult with severe acute respiratory illness, ICU admission, ARDS, or CURB 65 uh, score more than or equal to three points, and you did not find a reason for that illness, you have to think about COVID-19. So you have to test if the test of the mers cov influenza virus are negative and the clinical assessment of the patient not improving and no clear underlying cause, um, you should um, screen that patient for COVID-19 with or without identifying uh, identified epidemiological link. Uh, the definition for close contact defined as uh, uh, Healthcare associated exposure. So, if you if the patient is uh, or the person is providing direct care for COVID nineteen patient, working in uh, a healthcare facility that has an infected uh, COVID nineteen patient, visiting a patient in a healthcare facility that has a COVID nineteen patient, or working in close proximity or sharing the same classroom environment, for example, with a patient that has a confirmed COVID nineteen. Uh, testing, traveling together with a COVID-19 patient in any kind of transportation or living in the same household as a COVID-19 patient. Confirmed COVID-19 case defined as suspected case with a laboratory confirmation of COVID-19 infection. So what do we do uh, at our institution? If we have a patient that needs, uh, that has a high risk score and needs a case definition of COVID-19, they will be swabbed in a negative pressure room and we will immediately inform infection control and will admit them to a negative pressure room and isolation ward, which can be different in some other institutions. Um, so what is, the, what is the recommendation for infection control and precautions for healthcare workers? So there has been a debate. Uh, so mainly most of the societies uh, like the WHO or uh, the Canadian uh, uh, Societies uh, suggest that it's contact and droplet plus uh, goggles and face shield. The US CDC initially they also included airborne, but due to the lack, lack of uh, N95 and the shortage in the supply, they uh, currently uh, recommend contact and droplet until the supply chain come back and then they can use airborne. All society um, agrees that if you're doing uh, a procedure that might increase the risk for uh, increasing the risk of uh, splashing or uh, uh, viral content aerosol, you have to have also airborne precaution, which Dr. Mohammed Arafat is going to talk uh, in details about. So the diagnosis uh, for uh, COVID-19 is uh, done by a nasopharyngeal swab uh, or tracheal aspirate. Um, you have to keep in mind if you have a patient that you suspect COVID-19, you also should probably do nasopharyngeal swab for the common diseases like um, 
the RNA PCR for common uh, respiratory uh, infections, influenza A, H1N1, influenza B, and MERS. Uh, there are some uh, reports that suggest that uh, a lot of patients, about 80% of the patients, they present also a lymphocytopenia or thrombocytopenia less than 1,000, uh, 100,000. And also some some reports and some uh, uh, studies suggest is sending uh, inflammatory markers that CRP, uh, ferritin and LDH also has been suggested to be monitored uh, to monitor for uh, secondary HLH uh, that happens later. Uh, the mutation for RT PCR. So uh, there are a lot of limitation for this for this test mainly. Um, the sensitivity depends a lot on the technique. So the person who does the uh, nasal swab has to make sure that they're, we have to make sure that they are trained on doing it and knows how to do it uh, because the technique does affect uh, the sensitivity of that test. Also, the sensitivity is related to the viral load. So if, the, if you have a patient that has a, a severe illness, the likelihood of them having a high viral load and a lot of viruses in their uh, oronasal uh, airway will be higher than someone who has, is asymptomatic or uh, has mild illness. The sensitivity, um, is, we still don't know ex the exact sensitivity of uh, the RT-PCR, but most, it, it's around 70, between 68 to 80% based on some reports and some studies. Uh, also, another important thing that the single negative RT-PCR does not exclude COVID-19. So if you have a suspicion for a patient that has COVID-19 and you got the first initial negative PCR, you probably should repeat it in a few days uh, to make sure that it's not COVID-19. Uh, regarding radiology, chest x-ray is not sensitive uh, for diagnosing the um, uh, COVID-19. CT scan, there are some, some um, non-specific uh, findings uh, or signs like um, uh, ground glass opacities uh, and bilateral lungs. Um, it is sensitive, uh, but it's hard to be diagnosed for uh, COVID PCR. Some, some places has, in, especially in China, included CT scan as um, a screening tool. Uh, that is not supported with a lot of lit literature. Point of care ultrasound also uh, has good sensitivity, um, uh, but it's also operating uh, operating dependent. Uh, the signs in the point of care ultrasound are mainly um, increased B lines, pleura thickening, um, sometimes pleura effusion as well, and consolidation. Uh, so once we admit the patient, what should we do, especially in the ICU? We just continue with the usual ICU care. Most of the, the, the treatment for this disease is supportive so far. So you have to make sure that you have a good ICU care, that you have um, uh, managed it as a regular, a regular ARDS. So you need to follow the ARDS net protocol, uh, make sure that the patient has good synchrony with the, with the ventilator. Uh, uh, you should assess for ARDS severity and assess daily for the need for phoning of those patients. There are some reports that a patient goes into severe cardiogenic shock due to myocarditis, even after the uh, improvement of ARDS. Uh, there's two reports from, um, uh, from uh, there are some reports from Seattle and some report from uh, China that suggest that they go into cardiogenic shock. So if you have a patient who has a sudden deterioration in their uh, hemodynamics, think about uh, ordering uh, echo. Uh, pharmac pharmacological therapy, there is no therapy that is, uh, was tested in randomized control fashion so far. But there are some that was uh, used in China, such as chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine and uh, Calentra, uh, Calentra, which is uh, lipunavir and uh, ritonavir. Um, there are some uh, uh, data that's coming from uh, uh, the study that is done on the remdesivir that is uh, uh, that, that we are hoping that it's going to be working on um, on uh, uh, the COVID nineteen patients. So remdesivir is still not available yet in the market, but they are in in the last uh, part of their trial in the human trial. 
uh, this this medication was um, uh, developed to for Ebola uh, cases and MERS cases, and uh, we're just waiting for the final results of their studies and uh, to be available uh, in the market. But uh, so far, it's not available in the market. Um, and the last last uh, point that I haven't mentioned in patient that has uh, also severe respiratory distress or severe cardiogenic shock related to this disease, uh, ECMO is still an option. It's been used in Japan and China and Korea as uh, a salvage method, and it showed some uh, improvement. So I'll hand the mic to uh, Dr. Khamla. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Abdul Aziz. Uh, so again, uh, as Abdul Aziz started uh, his talk, um, I will focus about personal precaution or personal protective equipment during dealing with uh, those kind of patients. So um, what should I do during uh, high-risk procedures or laser generating procedures? So um, to, uh, to start with, uh, this is what we, we mean but by uh, erosal generating procedures. It's ranked here from uh, the top or the highest rate of uh, generating uh, to the lowest. Tracheal intubation is the topmost, uh, followed by tracheostomy or uh, uh, front of neck uh, airway or surgical airway. Non uh, invasive ventilators at, as uh, BiPAP and CPAP. Uh, also manual uh, mask ventilation or bag mask uh, ventilation and nasal uh, pharyngeal swap. Um, again, this is also some potentially uh, gener uh, erosive generating procedures as disconnection of ventilatory circuits during use, uh, extubation, cardiopulmonary resuscitation before intubation, uh, bronchoscopy uh, procedures and tracheal suction without closed inline system. Uh, talking about uh, uh, protective equipment, this is the list of equipment that it's a must to have. First of all, the disposable isolation gown. Uh, we're supposed to use the fluid resistant gown, not the regular yellow gown that we have. So to protect as, as much as possible from the fluid and secretion. Um, head cap also, fit tested N95 respirator or uh, mask, and we'll emphasize on this uh, later. Face shield or goggles, this is very important part also to protect your eyes and your face from any uh, droplets or secretion during doing procedures, high risk procedures such as uh, nasal uh, uh, swab or intubation. Uh, gloves, uh, we prefer and uh, it's advisable uh, to use double gloves, uh, alcohol based hand drop and uh, disinfectant wipes and uh, at last wipeable shoes. Uh, again, if you're dealing with a patient with potential secretion or, or spillage of uh, uh, body fluid, wipe the shoes is, is advisable. So assure that you can wipe, you can wash after exposure. This is the two type of masks that you usually use and the common types of masks in our healthcare institutions. Uh, simple or surgical face mask and the N95. Uh, speaking about the surgical mask, uh, it's a loose uh, mask that's used commonly for a respiratory virus, mainly to prevent uh, or the spread of the droplets uh, and to uh, that transmit the disease by cough and sneezing. So make sure that your patient, any any respiratory patient or patient with respiratory infection, supposed to have this mask all the time during transportation, during your assessment, or during uh, uh, medical interview. Uh, uh, wearing this type of mask will prevent or minimize the spreading of large sprays or droplets. As well, it will prevent uh, the hand-to-face contact for the patient himself. Again, to N95 mask. Uh, as we know, um, uh, N95 is a tight-fitting mask to prevent the inhalation of uh, uh, the small infectious particles, such as uh, or airborne infectious particles like TP, chicken box, and measles. So, but the very important part about N95, we should wear only fitted uh, mask. So we should do the fitting mask to make sure that this mask is uh, suitable for us with the maximum uh, uh, benefit and sealing effect. So this should be done uh, properly by the infection, your infection control department. 
Um, so when we should not use in 95, if I have facial hair or I'm not fitted or I failed the fitting test, or if I, uh, I, I had my fitting test, but um, for, for whatever reason, uh, the suitable mask is not available. So please don't try to use any other uh, N95 because this will not work for you. Either the one you you pass the fitting test or the only other option to have the popper, which is the power uh, air profi uh, profiling um, respirator. This should be the only option if, again, you don't, you, you, you fail the uh, N95 uh, test or um, you don't have the size that's fitted to you. Um, speaking about personal uh, personal protective equipment, the most uh, this is a major part: donning and doffing. Donning is the procedure of putting uh, in the equipment uh, uh, on your body. So uh, there is some important point that we need to focus on and to emphasize uh, before going to the sequence of this procedure. Uh, first of all, donning or putting in personal, uh, personal protective equipment must be in a space where it's safe, safe to the uh, healthcare worker. Uh, I, what we mean by that, it's away from the patient. Most, most commonly, the most common place that we use the anti room, but never try this inside the room or in an uh, unsafe uh, environment. Uh, always have all your equipment ready uh, and make sure that your N95 uh, uh, size is available. Um, make sure again to uh, have it prior to the entering of the patient's uh, area um, and have someone to, uh, to correct to, to make sure that the sequence is correct. So uh, the meaning of this, so we suppose uh, to have a donning and doffing officer or PPA officer so the job of this person for in, in, in any area with isolation or negative pressure rooms to ensure that every healthcare worker entering this room having his donning and uh, uh, doffing in the proper way and in the safe way. And also to check after you put in your equipment, uh, we, you need a person to check the safety of it. Uh, if it's sealed well, if there is any crack, any opening, any defect in in your mask, in your uh, face uh, shield or cover, or in your uh, gown. And lastly, please don't readjust your PPE while you are in the patient care area. For example, if you have your uh, your gloves contaminated, uh, either uh, if you decide that it can be removed by uh, hand hygiene, just go ahead and clean it inside with your hand hygiene. If you think that it needs to be changed, gloves or whatever part of your PPE, go out of the room, do donning and doffing uh, again as a new, but please don't readjust your PPE during uh, or uh, if you are inside the patient uh, room. So firstly, this is the, uh, the steps of uh, putting in the PPE. Uh, first, uh, the first step is to have your gown uh, on and to tie it from the upper neck and uh, waist, then apply your mask uh, either in 95 or uh, a surgical mask, whatever was needed, and then apply your goggles or face, uh, face uh, shield. Then we're going to the gloves. So um, the routine or what, what we usually do, we have one pair of gloves, but now it's advisable for uh, the higher the high risk, uh, uh, patient or suspected COVID patient to have two, uh, two gloves. So have the first gloves below the gown, then apply an other glove above the gown. So to maximize the sealing and to minimize any leak uh, to your skin. And so after doing this, if you went in, so leaving the room of the patient, we should do what, what we call doffing or removing the personal equipment uh, uh, protective equipment. Uh, so this procedure, it must be done inside the room. You should remove everything except the N95 inside the patient room. But please uh, pick a safe location, far as much as far from your patient, uh, at least two meters to three meters or six feet at the end of the room. Then leave the room with your mask in. Uh, as, as I said, don't remove, uh, the only thing that you can leave the room with is uh, the N95. Uh, please also an advisable point, don't compress waste in the trash. 
So uh, if it's full, full, just try to put your waste in different place because compressing this will also generate uh, erosions in the, uh, in the air. And again, this is summary of the CDC uh, endorsed uh, steps of doffing. We have two uh, ways, either starting by gloves, then removing the goggles and face shields, then removing the gun, then leave the room, apply hand hygiene, and after applying hand hygiene, remove your mask. Or the other way, uh, you can go directly to removing your gown with gloves together, then do hand hygiene, remove your goggles and uh, face shield, leave the room of the patient with your uh, mask, do again a hand hygiene, then remove your mask. Please ensure that we do hand hygiene between each step to maximize the safety and to minimize any risk of transmission. So um, after talking about personal protective uh, equipment, uh, we'll focus on some uh, special points for uh, or tips to, to use during dealing with patients with COVID, suspected COVID or confirmed COVID. First of all, please avoid any generating erosion procedures uh, as much as possible. Any procedure that needs more than six liter of uh, oxygen per minute, such as non breather mask, uh, bag mask ventilation, non-invasive ventilation, high flow nasal cannula, and uh, nebulizers. Uh, because this was proved by experience, uh, uh, by the experience from SARS, uh, as mentioned by Abdelaziz, uh, it showed that BiPAP and manual bagging increased the risk of airborne viral particles. And more than 90% of patients with SARS at that time failed the trial of non-invasive ventilator. So for this, please, any patient uh, you are dealing with as COVID or suspected COVID, the key here to intubate earlier for any patient who will start to need a lot of airway support, high flow oxygen, or non-invasive, intubate this patient as early as possible to minimize any erosal generating procedure and minimize transmission. For intubating this kind of patient, you should have a strategy. You, have, you should have a ready plan A, plan B, and plan C before uh, going to intubate this patient. Um, the choice, the technique of choice here will be a rapid sequence intubation or RSI. Uh, we'll not go in details about this. Um, also, intubation should be performed by the most skilled uh, physician. Why? To minimize the attempt, because with every attempt, will, uh, this will generate uh, uh, secretion, erosals, and will uh, risk the team. Uh, also, uh, for, for intubation, video scope or video laryngoscope is the best option with a screen away from the patient uh, to order, uh, in order to avoid placing the face of the intubator uh, close to the patient. So use video scope rather than the uh, uh, direct laryngoscope. Uh, after inserting the tube, please make sure that you calculate the depth to avoid escaltation and uh, a close contact with the patient. So go with the calculated depth rather than escaltation. Um, inflate the tube before, uh, make sure that your tube is inflated before connected it to the positive pressure ventilation, also to minimize the exposure and the erosion generation. Confirm your tube, please, by, in, uh, by cabinography. This will be the best option uh, uh, directly connected to the ventilator. Uh, try not to bag as much as possible. And at the end, avoid unnecessary discontinuation of uh, AT tube or disconnection of the ventilator from the tube. If you was forced to do this, some people advising to clamp the tube during uh, before connect, uh, disconnecting the uh, ventilator for whatever reason. And again, the last thing that we should emphasize in the PPE, we should have our PPE, PPE uh, with, with good or with very meticulous doning and doffing. Uh, please use your N95 uh, fitted test and have your PPE officer. This will be, um, uh, this will increase the safety and will improve our compliance to our PPE. And at the end, uh, please, protect yourself, protect your institute, and protect your beloved person and family. This is a tips that we can do it as healthcare providers uh, during this critical timing, um, that um, before work, 
have your uh, your uh, your extra clothes like whatever you uh, you prefer uh, remove all uh, potential risk of contamination such as watches things uh, and extra um, uh, accessories after work wash your arms wash your uh, hands up to arms please with soap place your dirty scrub in a bag change and uh, after that wash your hands and sanitize your badge your phone whatever uh, equipment was or devices was there inside with you when arrive your home please your shoes your work bag your silicon ring or in the garage or outside your home uh, whatever belongs what inside we try to minimize uh, the uh, to minimize bringing it or to prevent getting it inside your home and shower before the before touching your kids and inshallah rabbi yahmikum wa yahmi jami' wa inshallah this is uh, will pass this with um, uh, being very safe be uh, follow our infection control uh, precautions and thank you so much for giving us the time and uh, for listening to us